and welcome to this very special episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy, and of course, this is what you asked for. I am meeting with game designers to talk to them about how it was that they went about making their games and what they did and what their processes were and that sort of thing. And so today I am joined by Nathan Blades, aka Neon Caster. Nathan, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, how's it going? It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we appreciate the time and effort that you have put into making this game and then to sharing some of your insights with us uh, on mm -hmm. that same vein, because I'm sure a lot of you watching are dabbling around with your own systems. I know quite a few of you are, as a matter of fact, because you've sent me some of those systems and they've all been very, very interesting. But it's oftentimes just about getting it across the finish line, isn't it? You've got it mm. written up or you've got these ideas, you've got lots of scribbles or notebooks of, of bits and bobs. So... Let's talk first, because you haven't just finished one. You've got quite a few under your Oh, yes. So <laughs> let's talk about um, Heartbeats in Perfect Sync, which my camera won't focus on. Heartbeats in Perfect Sync. So tell us a little bit about that game. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I made that game um, because I am a big Kingdom Hearts fan, and I really love the urban fantasy that you only really see in like JRPGs and anime, not the kind of Constantine gritty American style, but the, how I describe it as uh, a love letter, the Heartbeats in Perfect Sync is a love letter to uh, twinks running up the side of skyscrapers, carrying twin swords to slap the embodiment of depression in the face. That kind of super high energy, shonen battle anime, anarchic energy. And I was like, what if that was a tabletop RPG? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. But that, that's, that's, that's the key there, is that you said, well, what if that was a tabletop RPG? Mm -hmm. So what was your first step? You're like, okay, so what if this is a tabletop RPG? How do I embody this? Because there are a couple mm. of systems that come to my mind when you describe this kind of scene. Mm -hmm. um, but none of them would, would really sort of carry across. Like there's Feng Shui, which came out a long time ago. Mm -hmm, which sits and in a much more kind of uh, Kung Fu movie style of space. It does, you're mm. right, so absolutely. Um, and there's not, there's, I don't think there's any rules on any kind of romance or depression monster. It's all, can you run on bullets? So, mm -hmm. so where did you start? Yes, uh, so uh, the kind of general rule that I have for the games I design uh, and, uh, and what I look to in other games I come across is uh, what is the key narrative experience you want your players to be really excited and fulfilled by, and how can you make the game mechanics really highlight and embrace that specific feeling. So when you are playing the mechanics of the game, you are also emotionally invested in that particular narrative moment, uh, because you can have games that do the same kind of dice roll for literally everything, mm -hmm. but then it makes it difficult to tie a specific emotion or feeling to a mechanical game experience. They sit almost as separate worlds. And I really love the games that manage to make a game mechanic feel like the experience you're supposed to be having. Um, Interesting. I'm loving this. So, so mm -hmm. just my silly brain is going, yeah, but you're rolling a your die. So. Mm. How, how does that relate to, like, slapping depression in the face? Okay, okay. You're going to hit it, right? So uh, for Heartbeats and Perfect Sync specifically, uh, to do anything, you have a dice pool called your heart rate. Uh, it goes from 1 to 10 and starts at 5, middle of the road. Uh, not only does it represent your ability to do things, where obviously rolling more dice is a better chance of getting hits, it's also a representation of how passionate you are. The more passionate you are, the more hot-blooded you're running, like your shonen battle animes, the more powerful you get. Likewise, when you're feeling more withdrawn and more emotionally kind of like compressed, you're rolling fewer dice. If, for whatever reason, you go below 1, or above 10 on your heart rate, you become heartbroken. And immediately you get to describe to the table about how you have a dark transformation, including outfit change. You gain a new combat ability. You technically become more powerful, but while you are heartbroken, you run the risk of death. So it fully embraces those kinds of like emotion-led storytelling in the dice mechanics. By being more powerful, you are also more emotional. And you are encouraged to, as your dice pool gets bigger and smaller, to also change how you role play and express your character. That I think is fantastic. That's a, that, that really is a great embodiment of 
that genre that you are describing. It's like, mm-hmm. I'm more powerful, but now I am even more angsty and, and, mm-hmm. and okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I like that. So when you start to build the mechanics, this was something that I was surprised at when I was doing Bounty Hunter and Mage Hunter, mm-hmm. was that in my game, there is no math. You are literally adding or subtracting one from mm-hmm. an, a non-roll. But there was a huge amount of maths that came into it once mm. you started to add in abilities or skills and things like that. And I had a, a, an army of, of volunteers who came in and they're like, yes, but if you take this and this and that and you combine them together, you statistically get more of this or you get less. You, did you have that process? Did you have that? Are you just a math genius? And you're like, oh, yeah, I saw <laughs> oh, that. Oh, I am, I am definitely not a math, math genius. While I think I am good at kind of getting game design elements into narrative i definitely operate on the vibes only when it comes to the counting um <laughs> uh, but i find that even though this is an original system uh, to succeed in the game is just to roll a five or a six uh, and there are many games that use d6s and mm. use five or six or hits and we know that works but it's how that's employed on top of other ideas that kind of the originality exactly. comes out in and because this is much more of a narrative experience rather than a kind of a, a combat efficiency sequence it's not really you could try and design your character in in a way that makes them the best at what they can be. Um, there is, uh, to mention one other mechanic, to also to explain the full title of the game, uh, if you and another of the player characters have the same heart rate and you've not acted yet in a scene, uh, you can do a perfect sync maneuver where both of you roll your dice at the same time, which if you both have a high heart rate is a silly amount of dice all to run at once and it's very, very silly. If you've ever played Shadowrun, the experience of rolling a bucket of dice, in that game, a bit of a faff. In this game, very exciting. Um, and it means you're very likely to succeed at what you do. Mm. So there would definitely be somebody who would go like, well, clearly then, if you were going to go and play this table RPG properly, you would make sure that you just have the same heart rate as everybody else and team up all the time. Oh, and they're like, yes, t- teamwork is good. Teamwork is thematically appropriate to the genre yes. that this game is. Thank you. Team up gotcha. with your friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 Lovely. Lovely. Okay, that's fantastic. I think that's really, really, really cool. Oh, now challenges writing this mm-hmm. did you just sit down and go okay so i want to do a narrative game based on the sort of anime precept and uh, right so and i'm done well, did you have mm. any challenges anything that you kind of got stuck on going oh how do i solve this or yeah uh i so i wrote um uh, heartbeats in 2020 uh, i had i had the free time to do so uh, some people did yes. mm. Mm. uh and that's now been a little bit long enough ago where some of the sticks I don't quite remember as much, Mm -hmm. but it was uh, thinking about the nature of um, enemies in the game. Uh, you can either just have them as nebulous enemies with no stats whatsoever, or you can build them as essentially a player character, but evil uh, called a prime pulse, the heart, puns go all the way down um and there was a degree of like oh well if they have the same mechanics as the player characters how do i build them in a way that they're a threat uh uh in terms of like game action economy i'm not interested in like initiative or people having multiple actions per turn the gm just gets a turn in which they raise the stakes and the world becomes more complicated and difficult so it's like well if it's a bunch of people fighting one guy mathematically the players are probably going to win because just by action economy but okay uh, it shook out yeah what you have in your hand is actually the uh uh, re-release i've been working on essentially an expanded edition with a whole bunch of new content new abilities finding new ways to kind of make the game more robust the original game was just six pages um so that was much more of an involved process of making it a bigger beefier thing and and talk to me about that process because you've got some delightful little illustrations in here which thematically work with the nature of a zine kind of release Mm -hmm. um and you've got the little heartbeat sort of lines everywhere which is which is really cool as well how did you go about that step of going right i've got these rules presumably Mm. written in word or open office or Mm -hmm, wherever mm -hmm. how do you move forward 
to be kind of good at something, you have to be kind of bad at something. Uh, I'd made a handful of uh, other zines and small projects made in everything from like Scribus to using Affinity Publisher to stealing my office's copy of InDesign to try and learn how to make a PDF that doesn't look garbage. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. then, I believe uh, the version that you're holding in your hand, the original six pager version, was okay. It worked. It had the same visuals of the the kind of uh, pink divider lines. Um, when I tried to update it for this expanded edition, it broke. It refused to do the things it needed to. Text boxes had jumped all over the place, and I was like, mm -hmm. "Oh no, I'm going to have to make this from scratch." Fortunately, uh, we have people like uh, Clayton Notestein, uh, who exist, who did the I, I believe book layout for Into the Odd and is generally well known as a, a tabletop RPG visual designer, in addition to, I think, being a game designer in his own right. And he has made a uh, an affinity and in design essentially template for what is supposed to be for OSR based, like that school of right. thought, very text heavy, but also yes. very elegant layouts. And he has a free version and a paid version, and it's just really easy to change all the bits and pieces. I changed some visual decisions because I know what I like to see. Um, the way that those border styles work is my idea, but the boring parts of making sure that all the text is the same size and spaced correctly and consistent is all a template made by a different person. And I'm pretty sure I do credit them, <laughs> their layout in there. If I haven't, I need to change that PDF before I print it for real. real. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does happen. Um... And I see that you've got game and soundtrack inspirations. Yeah. Talk to <laughs> me about that. Because I, I, I remember the most influential book that I have ever read as a <laughs> game master in role playing was Gary Gygax's book called Master of the Game. And in <laughs> that book, this was before the internet, of course, you understand. <laughs> in that book, he had a list of suggested reading material, <laughs> which... I think I'm still working through because it was like, oh, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica, um, <laughs> military tactics from the 5th to the 4th century BC. Uh, he had Fun reading. Mm -hmm. Fun, fun, light <laughs> yeah, yeah, reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what was, what, talk about the soundtracks. What have we, what have we got here? Yeah. Um, uh, they're mostly JRPGs, a couple of animes in there. Um, mm. So... I, even though my, my history playing tabletop RPGs goes way back to playing like GURPS in sixth form, um, bad choice of an opening start of a game. I've talked to, I've talked to that GM recently, uh, and while I love him dearly for putting me on this road, he's still the hardcore simulationist, but I, I, right. I, I love and accept him all the same. Um, <laughs> I got into like RPGs like now and in current era uh, through actual play. Uh, through listening to like Adventure Zone and being like, that would be fun to try and do, or uh, watching streams like a thrilling intent, uh, or essentially video recordings of people moving their tokens around in, in, in Roll20 and putting a soundtrack to it. And uh, there is uh, one designer, uh, Jay or Stabbiness, um, who is so good at making Roll20 actual theater. You never see a face, it is all. Uh, token map work and soundtrack design that mm. sets and soundtrack design for playing is one of my favorite parts of being a gm now of uh, finding video game music stuff without lyrics i obviously ideally because it's hard to talk over that or think while listening to words mm. but f doing deep cuts of finding music from all sorts of places that really fit the vibe and thinking about how they fit into the narrative of the story and as a result now because also I'm a music fan in general, mm. record collection in various. Uh, um, th I find the easiest way of getting a vibe across is to listen to something. Also, I have ADHD, so saying go read a book is hypocritical of me. <laughs> I don't think I, <laughs> if somebody told me to, I, I would have to read an entirely separate book to get the vibe of your game. I'd go, no, absolutely not. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Well, there we go. There we go. Um, no, that is that is wonderful. And in terms of printing, are you printing it? Uh, do, do you use local printers? Mm. Um, is it print on demand? What, what so what you have in your hand is a, a, a genuinely a pre-release copy of me uh, wanting to print the game that I've been working on and give it to uh, other creatives who I've worked with and enjoyed working with a lot. Uh, if 
um, okay to talk about the context of that. Uh, we, you recently hosted a six part series of uh, Star Trek Adventures second edition to which I was graciously invited as a player. And I looked at all the people who were attending and the powerhouses that they are as performers and games writers and stuff. And was like, okay, well, um, hopefully they will enjoy my uh, mm -hmm. uh, attempt at playing as a character in this world. And also uh, because I find it's a nice way to connect with other people who are also creatives is to give you a little bit of the art that you do as a thanks, I guess. So it's like, this is the new thing I'm working on. Maybe you'll get a kick out of it. Have that. Um, so, you know, you get it before it pops off, I guess. But uh, right. if I was to print it for real, I would be using a service like Mixam uh, to yes. uh, that do print on demand. Uh, uh, the physical copy of a, a zine that I worked on in mm. 2019, reprinting, did via Mixam. That will also be printed uh, via Mixam in time for a, a convention in November. I'm on schedule. I'm on schedule for having that done. Uh, <laughs> but yes. Yeah. Yeah. You have our support and sympathy. That's um, fine. I need to think of a cover art at some point and draw it. And I'm not cover that art. I've yeah. just spent <laughs> five days designing. Yeah, it was three days of the first cover. Mm -hmm. Finished the first cover, showed it to my graphic designer, and he went, yeah, okay, <laughs> we can use that. Mm. And I went, oh, all right, let me try something else. Mm. And this is some insight possibly shouldn't be shared but anyway i went martin because that's the name of the graphic designer what 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 should it be and he's like well it's got to look like it fits in your other series of books and you've done a red one and you've done a blue one so the next one should and you've done a green one so what's the next one what's the next in that color range and i was like pink with unicorns mm -hmm. and he's like yeah all right so i went Okay, challenge accepted. Pink with unicorns. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. a couple more days, and now we have a pink with unicorns cover, um, which has nothing to do with the content, but you know, it, it kind of works. Mm -hmm. um, so, I sympathize with you when it comes to the design element. How important do you feel the look is mm. in terms of that sort of thing? So, um, if I, if I, I mean, obviously, this is something that you printed for us. Um, for that for that event and you can catch all of those star trek episodes on this channel they mm. probably will have finished but oh no 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 still be going by the time this this airs episode um, three is great please if if you do nothing else get oh. to episode three it is the most emotionally like shaking episode yes. of a episode tabletop rpg played was... in a hot second it's really good <laughs> I, yeah episode three is where the gm goes i'm just eating popcorn and watching that's great <laughs> Uh, but mm. back on track. Yes, so, so graphic this design cover, for stuff. example. Mm -hmm. um, this is very evocative of the genre, the title, the color, the text, the layout, the font choices. Mm -hmm. How important is it to you, do you think? Yeah. Um, I, so uh, to be clear, let's not conflate graphic design with artwork. Yes, uh, because yeah. and this is not suggesting that you are but i know that listeners in terms of thinking process well clearly my game needs to have you know professionally painted no um right. we are as independent designers who have not hit the big time and are mm. not working for a big publisher having to compete with a really broad range of other uh games that are probably right. in a very similar genre to what you're currently doing i'm lucky in that i really enjoy a genre where there are fewer games to be a rival of if i was a big high fantasy fan i'd be sol um so it's thinking about how the color usage and font choice and stuff can really draw the eye in and evoke the idea that heartbeats in perfect sync is almost entirely monochrome aside from the big flashes of pink on the inside i think really help give it a strong visual identity um even if there was no text just like headlines and the font of the headlines it's kind of in a graffiti mark of font is a lot of the header text and things like that to really suggest the genre and environment it's supposed to be in and that you can do without needing to know how to draw at all i can I'm okay at drawing. I kind of hardline trained myself to draw portraits so I could RPG stream and have characters. Cause if I had to commission artwork for every single character, if mm -hmm. I couldn't draw myself, I would not have the money to do the thing. So I learned how to draw portraits specifically for that. But if you ask me to draw full body, it takes me a very long time. <laughs> um, 
So you find your strengths. Maybe your strengths is that you paint a lot of miniatures and so you have a really good understanding of color theory and color depth, you use that. Um, you stream and had to design like the the layout and where all the text and spacing is for your face versus the gra versus the game you're playing. And you understand that say, the size ratios, use that. Uh, if you don't know any of those things, as I say, there are layouts, pre-made layouts that exist that you can just take and make your own by changing the font. And that will be less exciting, mm. but it's still going in with a degree of design. There have been instances where there are people who I uh, uh, care about their development of kind of game design and have thrown money into the pot to support their efforts of releases. And I have gotten essentially an unformatted Word document for like $5. And I was like, you're lucky I know you. <laughs> if I didn't know you, I would be like charging my money back. Right, um, right. Yeah. Or, if, if, you know, you, to, to appease the people on Twitter or Reddit or whatever, you've got to have something visually about your game that gets people to like invest immediately because mm. they're probably not going to take the time to read after page two, especially if you're charging money. So thinking of a visual direction is really strong, but you don't need to know how to draw to do that. But you do need to learn some skills about visual mm. design. That's unfortunately mm. part of puzzle. Uh, I want to talk very quickly about mm. Wandering Spark because Ooh, Wandering yes. Spark is something that I'm very envious of. Um, it is literally that. Yeah, it was initially two pages. Initially uh, two, so this is the expanded version. <laughs> in a way, in a way, yes. Um, so, uh, you know, cutting your teeth in terms of game design, uh, one of the easiest ways to just kind of make a game uh, with low pressure, because the worst thing you want to do is make your first project a 400 page fantasy heartbreaker, uh, is to do a one page RPG. I am looking directly at you at the audience. If you've been working yes. on an RPG for like seven years and have not released it to anybody because it's not done yet, I'm sorry, you need to send that to somebody and then do a smaller project. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, yes. But uh, there was a um, a, a, a jam, a, a game design jam on itch.io called the Amor Ex Machina jam, specifically about relationships between robots and humans. Uh, it's kind of suggests itself to be specifically romantic in nature. I'm not really about romance games. I'm a, a queer person, and I do, and my games are all very queer, but they're not really about romance. Um, and I took that idea of like uh, robots and humans interacting with each other mm. and thought of some of my favorite stuff, like the works of Shinichiro Watanabe, who's a director who's done Shamurai Sampleu and Cowboy Bebop, those mm. kind of like vignette stories that are again, very music led, uh, very hip hop and black culture inspired mm. uh, and folding that into a, a game where it's a, a two player game with or without a GM. Uh, one of you is an engineer. One of you is an emancipated android. You've both been kicked out of your lives before and just have to kind of wander from place to place while you discover what your yearning is and try and go meet it. Um, and it came across, so it came about quite elegantly as what an asymmetric game. It kind of folded in in that interesting way. Uh, and it, yeah, it's just a fun piece of small storytelling, even though it's not my biggest game. I think it's the one I think fondly most fondly about or wistfully about because right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you say asymmetrical mm -hmm. is that because there is no gm or potential no um the mechanical experience of being an engineer is different to being an android so the engineer has stats they actually have stats with values in them and uh which i believe was their creativity mm -hmm. oh god i don't have it in front I've of got me it here. uh willpower creativity or charm yes uh, so they have numbers in those because they're people and of course they have levels of that they might not even be high but they have that uh this android who's been built for a purpose by other people uh doesn't need to have creativity willpower or charm so those are zero what they do have are directives uh the things that they've been programmed with that they should or should not do <laughs> <laughs> you know when you say that you're like well Duh. It's not like you're going to buy a machine that's designed to knit sweaters and then it's not going to work or it's going to knit a really good one and then it's going to roll badly and then it's going to knit a really Get emotional bad one. about it's it. It's just yeah, yeah, going yeah. to knit a sweater. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I like that. I like that. Again, that's you bringing in the thematic. 
yes to into the mechanics the, the mechanic yeah 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 uh, there's a point as the as you go from do your vignettes and you like mull on your vignettes after you do a location you roll some dice and then you as you're preparing to go to the new location or a camp for or whatever uh you can have a flashback as the android to a memory relevant to the thing you did that day and as a reward for doing that little piece of narrative storytelling you can break one of your directives that no longer gives you any mechanical rewards anymore, but you do get to choose willpower, creativity, or charm and set it to 35, which is higher than what the engineer can get. <laughs> <laughs> so your experience, you are both using the same dice rules and you're following the same story together, right. but how you interact with the world and how you progress as characters is very mm -hmm. different. The engineer has already had their story and they're already round weathered in different ways and mm -hmm. are dinged up by their past experiences and the android is discovering those as they also go through the journey i love it i love it well nathan we have gone way over time but ah, okay, sorry it was, fascinating. <laughs> it was lovely it was very interesting um very quickly where can folks find your stuff of course. Um, well, uh, to let you all know, once again, I have been your androgynous Android late night DJ, Nathan Blades. Uh, you can find my games. You can go play them, uh, download them and buy them for a very reasonable price at the neoncaster.itch.io. Um, if you like uh, actual play stuff and you want to see me tell stories mm -hmm. and be involved in those, not only can you catch me on Guy's channel uh, on the Star Trek Adventures run, uh, you can also hear me as the voice of Captain Oromar Vale on the Campaign Skyjacks podcast. Lovely. Absolutely <laughs> lovely. And yes, so um, thank you for being on the show. Thank and you for having me. Thank you for watching. And if you've got any thoughts, questions, put them in the uh, doobly-doo down below. You know what to do. I can send these questions on to Nathan and he will give us a response. Oh, I will absolutely the check the comments. Thank you so much for sitting here and listening to me talk about art. <laughs> it's well, like the best thing. <laughs> there we go. And until next time then, a huge thank you to the Patreons who keep the lights on and to you for watching all the way through until the very end. Until next time, I wish you and yours the happiest of game design.